Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And it says here, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That, as we would say here in the Ozarks, so that, so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, this Scripture tells us that we must understand all Scripture in order to be complete. And we need to understand that when this was written, the New Testament, the New Covenant Scriptures didn't exist. He was referring to the Torah, the Old Testament Scriptures, the Tanakh, and saying that what is in them is profitable for us. Now, we need to understand that every scripture in the Bible is not to the church, sometimes not even about the church. But every scripture is profitable for the church to know and to understand. There's some scriptures that are talking strictly to the Jewish people. And there are some scriptures that are talking strictly to the church. There are even scriptures talking to the heathen. So you need to know which category you go into when the scriptures are, are speaking. Well, today I want to talk to you about something that is, uh, once again, controversial. And I want to talk to you about the giants in the Bible. Now, in discussing the giants, one common thought is, what in the world does it matter? What does it have to do with me? Let me tell you something. It has everything to do with you. It has everything to do with your salvation. Now, knowing about it is not how you get saved, but it's kind of good for a Christian who is saved to understand some of the process that went through back in history, some of the process of how we attained our salvation. There are certain things that God had to do in order for the perfect lamb to be born so that he could shed his blood so that we could have everlasting life. Now, in the book of Job, chapter 38, verse 6, it says, To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now this tells us that the sons of God were at creation. In other words, the sons of God existed before the earth. They existed before the Garden of Eden. And we need to ask ourselves this question, who were these sons of God? Where did they come from? How long have they been in existence? Well, we do know this, and the Scripture tells us they were created, but they were created much millennia, eons of time before man, because they were there at the creation of man. In fact, in the book of Psalms, one of the Angel said, who is this man? Ask God, who is this man that you're mindful of him? Why are you thinking about him? In other words, why are you creating him? It's almost like someone would say, aren't I enough? Well, man, mankind was created to worship God and to fellowship with God for all eternity. Another question is, well, were the giants in the Bible fictional or were they real? And if they had a real existence, and if they were here on earth, then why do we not see them today? Why are there not giants today? 
Well, the Bible answers these questions and many, many more. Now, let's first take a look at the sons of God and let's define who were the sons of God. In the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, yud heh vav -Heh, and Satan also came among them. Now keep in mind, when Lucifer was in heaven, when Satan was in heaven, his name was Lucifer. And he was called Lucifer in the Scripture. But when he was cast out, he became the adversary. That's what the, the word Satan means, adversary, the one who comes against. He was, from that point on, he was called Satan or the devil. All right? So it, when the sons of God went to present themselves before the Lord, Satan had already been cast out of heaven. Otherwise, he would have been called Lucifer. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth. Where was he cast down to when he was cast out? To the earth. From walking back and forth on it. See, we must understand that Satan means adversary, and he comes against. Who does he come against? He comes against God. He comes against everything that God loves. And you need to understand this. God loves you. And you have an adversary, and it's Satan. Now, the book of Job, let's, let's look at a few things here. And some of this may seem like school, but I think you, you need to understand this. Job is a book that came from what is called the writing section of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. And it's the first of the poetic books in what the world calls the Christian Bible, in our Bible. Now, scholars generally agree that the book of Job was written somewhere between the 4th and 7th century B.C. That may or may not be true. However, one thing that we do know is that the law, remember the law that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai? He was given 10 written down commandments, and then he was given 603 oral commandments. In the entire 42 chapters of the book of Job, the law is not mentioned once. So the book of Job, the the event of Job predates the law, which was given approximately 3,500 years ago. So this event in the book of Job is an ancient event. Now, contrary to general belief, you know, I, I heard a sermon by a man one time who said that the book of Job was metaphorical that Job was a fictional character. He was in a parable that was just written. But see, evidently, that particular minister doesn't have a Bible. <laughs> because, see, what you do is you, you judge Scripture by Scripture. Now, there are other writings, and I use some of these other writings, you know, as reference, but the only true writing that I know 100% is true is the actual scripture in the word of God. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 14, the Bible tells us that the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel stood up and he spoke, and he spoke on behalf of the Lord. And here's what it says in chapter 14, verse 12. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply and bread, send famine on it, and cut, man, and cut off man and beast from it. But look at verse 14. Even if, what are these next three words? These three men. So he, this is God speaking. Okay? And God is saying, even if these three men, and then he names three men, not fictional characters, not Donald Duck. I mean, he, he, he's talking about real people, these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job. So this lets us know that Job was a, was a real person, which further verifies that what happened in the book of Job was real. It's not fictional. You've got to get that out of your head. Now, who were these sons of God? 
Once again, Job 1.6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. You know, the earliest sources, not sources written now, but sources written back in the day, interpret the sons of God as angels. From the 3rd century B.C. until now, onwards, these ancient writings have not changed. The Book of Enoch, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Genesis Apocrypha, the Damascus Document, the Book of Jubilees, the Testament of Reuben, 2nd Barak, Josephus, all these books that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in our Bible, in Jude and 2 Peter, and in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible that many of the apostles used, in every one of them, the interpretation of the sons of God is angels. Now you say, well, are, are you sure about that? Yes, I am. 2 Peter 2.4 says, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood on a world of the ungodly. See, it's telling us there that there were angels that sinned at the time of Noah. Well, who were these angels that sinned at the time of Noah? Well, the Scripture tells us in Genesis 6, we'll see in a few moments, they were the sons of God. Now, it says that they were cast down into hell. The word hell there, it's interesting, in the Greek text is Tartarus, or Tartarus, depending on which school you went to. But that is uh, referencing a place back in Homer's Id and the Odyssey that was the deepest part of hell. The, well, the deepest part of Hades was Tartarus. In fact, it was said that Tartarus is far deeper from hell than the earth is from heaven. So, in other words, these angels didn't just get confined to a, a regular prison, so to speak. They were committed to chains in pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Now, when is that judgment going to be? Well, that judgment's going to be at the end of the millennium, and that's when the angels are judged, and you can find that in the book of Revelation. Now, it's interesting that we find um, that many people talk about how all of the angels sinned at the time of Noah, and that's why we don't have any fallen angels on the earth right now. Well, that... Uh, that's not true. Um, let's take a look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God, and we established who they were, the sons of God saw the daughters of men and they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. See, we must assume that these angels had intimate relations. In fact, some versions of the Bible even interpret it that these angels had intercourse with human women. And the Bible tells us that the offspring that were born to them were the Nephilim. These were the giants of old. There were many perversions taking place on the earth. And we find from the book of Enoch and other ancient writings that some of this per perversion, which is explained in detail, had to do with making hybrids, and that some of the offspring of the angelic human relationship were even part man, part animal. And so many, and I, I believe this, that many of the ancient Greek gods that were born out of mythology, you know, that we call mythology, 
were actually rooted in a truth that happened back at the time of the flood. Now, this brings us to another interesting thought, and that is, can angels procreate? Can angels have children? Could an angelic being place a seed into an earthly woman? Well, of course, many would say that um, that's impossible, but we need to look at what the Scripture has to say. Yes, uh, we know that angels can take on many forms. We know that when the two angels were in a Sodom, that they looked so perfect that the men of Sodom, who, who desired angels and who desired men, because they were homosexuals, they, these men were so perfect that these men wanted to have intimate relations with these two angels. And Lot knew that that was something that God hated. And so he even went to the extreme to offer his daughters to these men so that they would not have relations with the angels. But the angels evidently had powers that um, were strong enough, they just blinded all those men. So we can see that angels can take the form of men, but we know that angels can take other forms also. And we know that there are warring angels, there are worshiping angels. You know, as I've said before, there were angels with two with, with four faces, I've, I've met some people with two, but, you know, <laughs> but there are some angels with four faces, and, and the ones in Ezekiel, you know, where the, the chariot comes down, the chariot of fire that has the wheel within the wheel and all that, the angels there are very similar to the four beasts that are angels in the book of Revelation, but they're not exact. So it lets us know that there are angels within orders. You know, we have uh, archangels. We have cherubim, seraphim. Uh, and, and there's so many different ones. But they all come together as listed as one group, angels, the heavenly host. The, the, why do they say the heavenly host? Because there's such diversity in heaven. You couldn't even list everything. It's amazing, isn't it? Well, here's uh, something that I know is rattling around in the minds of some right now. Didn't Jesus say? Well, here's what you need to understand. Um, there were two groups that really fought against each other at the time of Jesus. There were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees, they believed in life after death. They believed in eternal life of a human. Sadducees believed that you were like a cockroach. When you died, you're dead, you're done. Okay, And they, they fought between the two. And so they went to Jesus. They were scoffers. And, and they came to Jesus and they tried to trick him. And they said, okay, Jesus, uh, answer this question. There's a woman. She's married. And her husband dies. Legally, she can get married again. So she gets married again. And lo and behold... That guy dies. And this happens, it happens many, many times. Now, eventually, she dies. Now, when she goes to heaven, which, which one of those guys is her husband? And uh, they were attempting to get Jesus cornered on the resurrection question. But here's what happened in Matthew twenty two twenty nine. 29. It says, Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. Well, here's what you need to understand. Jesus was talking about in the resurrection. And he also said this. He said that after the resurrection there will be no marriage or giving in marriage in heaven with our resurrected glorified bodies. 
will be holy like the angels in heaven. But the angels who sinned were neither in heaven nor holy. Now, I know that God is not an angel. God is not in the class of angels. But the scripture tells us God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, the Bible tells us, and I understand, and I, I, I make a distinction here, but, we, but think about this. The Bible tells us that it was the Holy Spirit that came upon Mary and placed that seed within her. So, I'm not saying that they're God, angels are not God, but what I am saying is there is an example of spirit making a difference in the womb of a woman. But nevertheless, the Bible does tell us that these angels cohabited with these women and there were Nephilim born to them out of this unholy union. Now the Bible gives us three different words for the offspring of this unholy union. The words are Nephilim, Raphaim, and Rapha. They are referred to in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 21, and these words are always translated as, in these passages as giants. They are large, human-like hybrids with great strength. Now these ancient giants existed before the flood and afterward, we'll mention in a moment. But you'll see that everywhere they were, they brought great wickedness on the earth. They had a goal, and their goal was to destroy the plan of God. Now, it's interesting. There is a common teaching, and you'll find it in many of your Bibles in the reference, called the Sethite view. Now, what this is, is they teach that the sons of God were nothing more than the sons of Seth. And that the daughters of man were the daughters of Cain. And they say that for several reasons. One of the things that they use is they say, well, the, the, the sons of Seth were righteous and the, and the daughters of Cain were evil. But if you trace the genealogy in the Bible, you're going to find out there was a lot of unrighteousness that took place in the lineage of, of Seth and there was some righteousness that took place in the lineage of Cain. So that, that's out. You know, this, this view did not come into existence until centuries after Jesus. All of the apostles, all of the writings at the time of the apostles, and all of the teaching that was done at the time of Jesus taught that they were angels. There was um, an early church leader, you probably heard of him, Augustus of Hippo, he must have been a fat guy. Oregon, <laughs> that, that was a little humor, I had to add just a little humor into this. Uh, Oregon, uh, letters that were attributed to St. Clement, um, but it's very easily disproved by just basic scholarly review. Although many well-known Christian leaders hold to this view to this day. Why do, why do they do that? Why do they do that? Well, I have uh, determined over the years of being in ministry, and I've been in ministry for five decades, and I'll tell you something, there's a lot of people that just do not want to acknowledge any supernatural events. They want everything to just be normal. I mean, they don't believe the rapture's going to take place. They don't believe that angels would do anything like this. If you, if you go to a church that casts out demons, oh, something's wrong with you. You must be some kind of weirdo because anything supernatural they want to discard. Well, God is a supernatural God. And let me tell you something. There's a lot of supernatural stuff that takes place. And we can either ignore it or acknowledge it. And we need to acknowledge it in order to walk with the authority that we've been given to rule and reign over evil. So uh, I have more about this in my notes. I just don't have time to give it all to you right now. <sighs> Okay, why did God bring on the flood? 
Why, why the flood? I heard a, a person in a Sunday school class many, many years ago in a Baptist church I attended uh, made the comment, well, God's good and God's bad. He's, he's good and he's evil. Because after all, he brought the flood that killed everybody on the earth. Men, women, children, everybody. Babies, pregnant women, killed them all. Well, let me, let me say this to you. There was a day when the serpent and Adam and Eve stood before God. And in Genesis 3.14 it says, So the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your work, your, your life. And I will put enmity, that means war, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. At that moment, the enemy, Lucifer, who was cast down and became Satan, that serpent in the garden, he knew that his destruction was going to come through the seed of the woman. And what he wanted to do was to destroy the seed of the woman. Jesus was ordained to sacrifice his life for us before the foundation of the world. Because God can do something that the devil can't do and that we can't do. No other being in existence can do but him. And that is he is omnipresent in the respect also of time. And he can see as far back into the past or as far as he wants into the future and he can observe what's going to happen before it happens. And he knew what was going to happen and he prophesied it and the enemy, the devil, somehow feels he can alter that reality that's going to come to pass. Now, in order for the perfect sacrifice, the lamb, to be slain on the altar in heaven on the perfect Ark of the Covenant that's in heaven that it tells us about in Hebrews, not the one on earth, but the one in heaven, that Ark was created much before in time in order for the sacrifice of the Son of God to be, have his blood placed on it but his blood had to be perfect. See, just, just like in Old Testament times, they, they wouldn't sacrifice a lamb that had a flaw. It had to be a lamb without spot or blemish. This, this was the, the way God did things. This was part of his own rules he put upon himself, saying that sacrifices to him had to be perfect without spot or blemish. So what did the devil do? Once these angels and the reading in the book of Enoch and some of the others, it talks about these watchers, these 200 watchers. After they mated with these earthly women, the devil saw this as an opportunity to pervert the seed of God. But once, once this virus-like situation took place, all of mankind, all of mankind was, was becoming perverted. And in their perversion, it wasn't just that they did perverted things. Genetically, their DNA was perverted. And so God, because He loves us, did what needed to be done to preserve the perfect DNA so that the perfect Lamb of God could be born so that there could be a perfect sacrifice, so that we could have salvation through His sacrifice. Hmm. Well, God found a man. Genesis 6-9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, Perfect in his generations. It didn't say perfect in his actions. It says perfect in his generations. This can be interpreted and could mean, and many interpret it this way, that Noah had not been subjected to or infected with any 
fallen angel DNA, in his generations, he was perfect. All right? Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Loretikos and Japheth, that's true. All right? The earth also was corrupt. corrupt. The earth, what? The earth was corrupt before God. And the earth filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them. See, the story of the flood is often told, and, and I understand when you're dealing with children and, and, and such, you, you need to break it down to something they understand. But even as adults, sometimes all we get is the fact that, you know, the animals came on the ark two by two, and they floated on the ark, and the little dove and all this, and he comes down and Noah makes an altar and does a sacrifice before the Lord, and that's the story of the ark. It's much more than that. See, God took everything that was not perverted and put it on the ark. I mean, why are there not some species today that were ancient species? They didn't make it to the ark. Two by two, two Tyrannosauruses went on the ark. No. Okay. That's a complete different story. Hmm. But see, if, if the enemy could manipulate the DNA of man and make a hybrid, then how could the perfect son of man be born? He would have spot and blemish. Hmm. Wow. Satan hates God. And he hates what God loves. And you need to understand this. God loves you. So there's, there's attacks. The Bible tells us that attacks will come. Trials will come in our life. But we have been given authority. I mean, why would James say, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, and he goes on. How can you consider it joy? Have you had a trial in your life? We've had attacks in our life. But we know, we, we've read the entire book. We know how the story ends. It ends with victory for God and his people. You know, <laughs> hallelujah. Well, okay, moving right along. Don't you just love Jesus? I, uh, I sometimes think about what he did for us. And how, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, which, by the way, we'll be going there and uh, having communion in the Garden of Gethsemane, all, all of you who are going to Israel with me in March. But Jesus was in the Garden, and he said, Lord, he said, if there's anybody up there that, I'm paraphrasing, if there's anybody up there that has a second opinion on something else we can do, and he was say, basically saying, so we don't have to do this dying on the cross thing. It would be very much appreciated. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And even though he went through excruciating pain, you do remember that he rose again. And he took his place at the right hand of the Father. So sometimes after great pain, there's great victory. We need to understand that. So just consider it all joy when you encounter a various trial, knowing that the testing of your faith is going to produce something way beyond, in glory, what the pain was. Hmm. Okay, so we have the genealogy of Noah. Let me give you this scripture, 1 Peter 1.20. For in, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days. For you. 
See, God had a plan. And, and he knew what the devil was going to do. But the devil didn't know how it was going to turn out. I think that's one thing we need to understand. The devil still thinks he can win. Because he doesn't have the ability to see in the future. He somehow thinks. He believes his own lies. Jesus said in John 8, that he was a liar. But he's lied so much that he believes his own lies. And he somehow thinks he can stop the progress of God's prophecies. But he hasn't so far, has he? All right. Now, here's something that's interesting. In Genesis 6-4 it says, There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. Now, this is interesting. Keep in mind that we had all these giants on the earth, we had perversion, and then we had the flood. And the boat that Noah was on, there was Mr. and Mrs. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Japheth, and they were the sons of Noah, and evidently their DNA was pure because Mr. and Mrs. Noah were pure. But shortly before the ark took off, the Bible tells us, and ancient scriptures tell us, ancient writings, excuse me, tell us, that it was just a short time before the ark started to float that the three sons of Noah took wives. So this brings us to uh, a question, and that is this. After the flood, we know that the nation of Israel was born, had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had his name changed to Israel. He had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. And they were in Egypt. And then afterward, Moses took them out of Egypt. And then afterward, they had kings. Remember, there's King Saul. There's King David. Remember David? Well, David himself killed a giant. Goliath. You know, he took a slingshot and it, something entered Goliath's mind that had never been there before, and he decided to go Goliath down. <laughs> and he, <laughs> he, he had his, his head removed, and David carried it around for a long time. I mean, huge head. <laughs> Goliath had the big head. No, David actually had the big head. <laughs> and he took it to... Jerusalem, and he put, it, he put this head on a stick, drove the stick into the ground, put this head on a stick, and that's where Golgotha came from. So, it's interesting, there were giants. Now, there were other giants, and, and for sake of time, I just can't really get into it right now, but, but uh, Goliath had four relatives. One of these relatives had six fingers and six toes, you know, tw 24 digits. And uh, these were killed. There was even Og, the king of Bashan, who was uh, one of the last remaining giants of his tribe. And the Bible says he was killed by one of the leaders of Israel. And uh, he slept on a bed that some, some versions say that it was like 15, 16, some, one person even said up to 18 foot long, depending on how you measure a cubit, and he, he filled the bed. Do you realize that these giants we're talking about were not just like basketball players? They were people that, that right now, standing in front of me, a kneecap, a kneecap would be about here. So, they did exist, and there were tribes of them. And the Bible talks about the tribes, and I've got all the scriptures here to, to read to you about that. But without going into all the details, um, well, you know, they, the Israelites were originally told to um, wipe out the Anakites. And they were a subset of the Nephilim. And in their conquest of the promised land they were told to wipe this tribe out they didn't do it and this tribe sur survived and settled in the the land of goth and its surrounding cities and 
And a lot of their descendants became known as what uh, were called the Philistines. And um, you can see from Genesis chapter 14, and I won't read you all of that, that there were many tribes of giants. It's, um, well, 1 Samuel 15, 3, I want to read you this. Go now and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Kill them all. Why? See, now people who don't know, they read this and they think, boy, God's mean. God, God's bad. And he's just saying, kill everybody. But these were people with defective DNA and they needed to be wiped out. And eventually the giants were. Now, this brings us to the question, if all the giants were wiped out before the flood, and the scripture says there were giants on the earth then and afterward, how did the giants appear after the flood? <laughs> well, one great Jewish writer wrote that they hung on the side of the ark. Well, <laughs> you know, that, that's a good thought, but it's not true. You know, it's not true. We'll notice that Noah's three sons, one of them, Ham and his wife, there were, there were things that took place there. And our Bible talks about cursings that took place in that lineage. But if you'll trace back these giant tribes, that's where they, they come from. So my personal opinion, and, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's, it, this is my opinion, that the wife of Ham, and you know how God feels about Ham. <laughs> the, the, the wife of Ham had defective DNA. This is why the giants after the flood were not as large as the giants before the flood. But, you know, th this is one of those things where regardless of how it happened, according to Scripture, it happened. There were giants on the earth then and afterward. And somehow it happened. Was there a second incursion? No, there was not a second incursion. Some people teach, and even some of my good friends teach, that uh, there was a second incursion of angels. No, all of these watchers and, and everything that happened to them as a result of the first incursion in Genesis chapter 6, when they were committed to pits of darkness, when to Taurus, the depths of Hades, and reserved for judgment, I would imagine at that point, all the other angels who had that thought decided, no, nah, not, not now. Uh, no. The example was made, and, and uh, we have no scriptural reference anywhere that it happened again. All right? So, I'm doing pretty good so far here. And yes, I do know when the football game starts. <laughs> Jude, Jude 1.6 says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, for judgment of the great day. Wow. Hmm. So, what does that have to do with us? Here's what it has to do with us. Let me read you a scripture. And I don't know if you've ever heard this scripture or not. You know, there are scriptures in the Bible you probably haven't heard. But just trust me, this is in the Bible, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Why did all this happen? God has continually protected the sacrifice that was to be given in heaven after the resurrection of the only begotten Son of God. He's done everything to protect that event so that when that first drop of blood touched the lid of the Ark of the Covenant in heaven, the mercy seat, that made it possible for all of us to just believe in Jesus and have everlasting life and become a part of the church, the body of Christ, and for all eternity, the Scripture says, God will refer to the church as the trophy of His grace. We are married to Jesus. <laughs> you might say we are Jesus' trophy wife. <laughs> Not really. But... <laughs> We are the trophy of God's grace. If anybody says to God in the future, uh, do you really have grace? God can point to the church and say, look at this collection of knuckleheads. <laughs> they didn't do anything to deserve what they got. Nothing. They didn't die for it. My son died for it. They didn't do the works. Their righteousness was like filthy rags. But we gave them my righteousness. And to top it all off, everything that Jesus was going to get, which was everything that was created, he's going to share it with them. Now, you don't think I have grace? I am grace. So, why was the flood? It's because he loved you. Why did he kill the giants? Because he loved you. He sacrificed his son, his only begotten son, because he loved you. And he just wants us to receive this free gift. It's free to us, but it was very costly to him. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Is that true? Yeah. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by his Father? Do you believe that? Is Jesus Christ your Lord? Do you believe that? Say it, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. According to the Scripture, if you believe that, what you just said, you have it. You say, well, it can't be that simple. It is. That's the problem. Too many religious organizations try to complicate it. They say, you've got to kneel this way. You've got to do this. You've got to twirl the beads. You've got you to do stuff. Let me tell you something. You don't have to do stuff. All you have to do is believe in Him, yes. repent of your sin, turn away from your sin, and on occasion when you do mess up, say, I repent, forgive me of my sin. And He is more than willing to cleanse you from all this unrighteousness that's happened. <laughs> Hallelujah. Stand up. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, we give you thanks for all that you've done through the eons of time to make a way for us. We totally understand we are not deserving, but we also are very thankful. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And for all eternity, we'll say, thank you, Father. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.